I'm from Hartford and not too far from here. I'm also the outreach coordinator for Connecticut Against mm -hmm. Gun Violence. In 2012, a bullet forever changed my life. It was on a Saturday afternoon, October 20th, 2012. That bullet took the life of my son, Shane. He was 20 years old, and like so many other victims of gun violence, Shane's death was senseless. And his case, an argument turned physical and then fatal. A bullet pierced three of his major organs and Shane died fighting for his life in surgery at Harvard Hospital. For a long time, I was paralyzed by his loss. Shane was the light of my life, my only child, and my best friend. Simply put, he was my everything. In the blink of an eye, my child was gone. My life was turned upside down, and I had begun, become a gun violence survivor. As a survivor and as a mother, the grief is unimaginable. You learn a pain that you never knew was possible. You learn the loss is unique and universal for thousands touched by gun violence each year something that transcends race, religion, and spans our cities and our suburbs and reaches every corner of every state in the country. For me, working with Hartford's youth and doing community outreach with Connecticut Against Gun Violence has turned, helped turn my pain into purpose. I get up each day to honor Shane's memory and try to build a better world for my granddaughter, the child Shane never got to meet, but who carries his name and his smile. I've dedicated my life to helping ensure no other parent has to endure the pain of burying their child because of an act of senseless gun violence. If I can reach one teen to let them know there is a better way then maybe I can save one life and save one mother from this type of heartbreak. There are many ways to make a difference, and we all need, and we need them all. From youth intervention in the streets of Hartford and cities like Hartford across the country to common gun, common sense gun reform down in Washington. Leadership takes many forms, and that's why we are here today in the treasurer's office. I want to thank State Treasurer Sean Wooden for standing up and doing something. Many of you may not know, but Treasurer Wooden is also a gun violence survivor. Just a few months before I lost my son Shane, in 2012, Treasurer Woody lost his cousin Mike to fatal gunshots in Hartford as well. He was just 24 years old. Every devastating story of gun violence is unique and heartbreaking, and there are far too many to tell in this short amount of time. We need to tackle gun violence from every angle. That's why Treasurer Woody has brought us here today. It's a tremendous honor to introduce and turn it over to State Treasurer Sean Wooden. He is Connecticut's Chief Elected Financial Officer and is responsible for business decisions involving billions in investments, borrowing, and banking transactions on behalf of the state. I want to thank Treasurer Wooden for this opportunity to speak and for his leadership on behalf of so many families that have been touched by the violence, gun violence. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first, thank you, Janet, for your courage, your compassion, uh, for being here today with us. You give voice to parents all across Hartford, our state, and our nation. And I just want to thank you for, for your work and you continuing the fight along with many others. Thank you. Thank you. I 
also want to thank those standing beside me today. I'm honored to be joined by representatives of Connecticut Against Gun Violence, Moms United Against Gun Violence, Newtown Action Alliance, CONNECT, which stands for Congregations Organized for a New Connecticut, Connecticut Education Association, the American Federation of Teachers Connecticut, and my cousin, Vanessa Williams, a survivor. Thank you all for the work that you do and for your support here today. In June of 2012, my family lost Vanessa's son, Michael. In October of 2012, we lost Janet's son, Shane. And in December of 2012, our nation lost its innocence. The conscience of our state and our country was shaken to its core by one of the darkest tragedies of our times. 20 innocent first graders and six amazing adults lost their lives to a terrible act of gun violence at Sandy Hook Elementary School. The nation grieved with Newtown and we committed to never fail our children like this again. It was because this tragedy changed us that we vowed to change the laws. This heartbreaking loss shined a bright light on the gaps in state and federal regulations that could have prevented deadly military-style weapons from getting into the wrong hands. It prompted our legislature and our governor to make sweeping changes to our gun laws, making Connecticut home to some of the strongest gun violence prevention laws in the country. Out of profound pain came purpose and perseverance to bring this fight to Washington and to speak out on many other aspects of gun violence, including the effects of guns in urban America, where communities of color are disproportionately impacted by gun violence. It took a tragedy to create change, but sadly, not enough change. Efforts to advance meaningful gun reform at the federal level have stalled at every turn in the Senate. Despite the death toll from gun violence rising, despite mass shootings in Las Vegas, Parkland, and countless other communities, despite the pleas of parents, our kids, educators, law enforcement, and healthcare professionals, despite calls from corporate America and steps taken from Walgreens to Walmart, despite the fact that an overwhelming majority of Americans support universal background checks, despite that and so much more, our nation and our neighborhoods continue to be ravaged by senseless gun violence. Today, I'm speaking to you as Connecticut State Treasurer, but I'm also the youngest of six kids that grew up in the North End of Hartford, and as a father of two black boys. I know the statistics well, and as I've said before, it's far more likely for me to have ended up in a casket than to be standing here before you as Connecticut State Treasurer. I know that I, along with so many well-meaning people of good faith of all races and all religions across our country and our state have grown weary of the senseless violence plaguing our country and weary of the politicians that want to offer up nothing more than thoughts and prayers. So yes, this issue is personal to me. However, as state treasurer, Gun violence is a matter of significant financial concern, which warrants the attention of this office. I serve as Connecticut's chief elected financial officer. I'm the fiduciary for more than $36 billion in pension and trust assets for more than 212,000 state employees and teachers. I oversee more than $25 billion in borrowing and $152 billion in cash transactions each year. It's my responsibility to look out for the best interests of taxpayers and retirees 
by ensuring that we maximize returns while minimizing risk. And simply put, the business of civilian guns has become an increasingly risky proposition. Each year, in Connecticut alone, an average of about 180 lives are lost to gun violence. And gun violence cost our economy, right here in Connecticut, about $1.2 billion each year. Failure by the federal government, and the U.S. Senate in particular, to enact meaningful gun reforms require a new approach, a renewed sense of urgency, and a call to action on every front. This is why my actions today are necessary and why tomorrow I'm heading down to Washington to join advocates from across Connecticut and across the country and convening our Congress Connecticut congressional delegation to push for common sense gun reforms. Last year, prior to becoming state treasurer, I spoke about respecting the Second Amendment and the need for reforms. I also vowed to divest from irresponsible gun manufacturers. Well, today, I am making good on that promise and going much, much further. Today, I'm in introducing my responsible gun policy. This policy is a first of its kind, comprehensive approach to better manage the financial risk and costs associated with gun violence. Consider it a 3D view and response, divestment, disclosure, and decision-making. First, divestment. We will divest from all civilian gun manufacturing companies. From an investment perspective, the stock prices of civilian gun manufacturers are volatile and face significant risks that have an impact on company profitability and long-term shareholder value. These risks include financial, reputational, and legal. In fact, the recent Supreme Court decisions underscores all of these risks. It allows a lawsuit by the families of Sandy Hook victims to proceed against a gun manufacturer. Divestment means 30 million in pension fund investments will be reallocated to more stable investments with the same return targets to increase long-term shareholder value for Connecticut's pension funds. Second, disclosure. We are engaging banks on their policies and relationships with the civilian firearms industry. As part of our contracting process going forward, we will ask banks and other financial institutions to disclose their gun policies. And for banks that do not have policies in place, we are encouraging them to adopt responsible gun safety policies. Third, decision-making. A financial institution's gun policies will be incorporated into this office's decision-making process. We want to work with good financial partners that are adequately managing the risk related to gun violence. That's why today I'm also announcing that Citibank and Rice Financial, two firms that want to be part of the solution on gun violence, have been selected as the senior bankers for Connecticut's next general obligation bond sale of $890 million. Last year, Citi stepped up to be a market leader on gun safety in the financial services industry with the announcement of their gun policy for retail sector clients, which requires universal background checks, a minimum age of 21 for gun purchases, and a ban on the sale of bump stocks and high capacity magazines. At the Treasurer's Office, we want to incentivize the financial services industry to do the right thing, like these types of policies that help mitigate the risk of gun violence. As a result, when awarding financial and banking business, I will consider an entity's gun policies as one factor among many. So, through divestment, disclosure and decision making at the Connecticut Treasury, we will change the way we do business. In simple terms, money talks, 
and I want our policy to speak loud and clear. We will disrupt the status quo to produce better returns and safer communities. May it speak loud enough to reach those lawmakers in Washington who continue to be on the wrong side of history in opposition to common sense gun reforms. And may it speak clear enough for gun manufacturers to understand it's time to make safer, smarter products for the marketplace. Countless tragedies continue to fall on deaf ears. So it's time for money to do the talking and for money to motivate the change we need. Thank you. And with that, I'm happy to take some questions. Do, for the $30 million divestment, do you need um, any approval from the advisory committee or, or from the unions? Yeah, this month I will be introducing an amendment and changes to the investment policy statement for this office to the Investment Advisory Council, okay. which will take it up. And so that would be, I would expect that to be uh, taken up. It's a process in terms of notice, but taken up in uh, most likely February based on the timing and notice requirements. Okay, so this won't be happening immediately, but it will be. Correct. You're confident that they would approve it. Um, I've had conversations and I feel there's a great deal of support, okay. uh, not just in the IAC as we call it, but in the state of Connecticut. How do you respond to critics who say these are law-abiding businesses, these are businesses that are that are legal in the U.S.? Um, how do you respond to that criticism of well, that? Um, well, it, it's, a, it's a matter of fact, so I don't take it as a criticism. Mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. They're law-abiding businesses. But the critics say they're being punished. They're law-abiding, but they're being punished. Right, but but we're, we're, we're all abiding by the laws in mm -hmm. this country. A uh, number of us are trying to change them. But mm -hmm. yes, they're law-abiding citizens, but as an investment matter, and mm -hmm. I need to be really clear about this because mm -hmm. all of this gets muddled, mm -hmm. right? We're talking divestment. Mm -hmm. That relates to our pension funds, mm -hmm. right? And that's separate from the disclosure and doing business, which is across Treasury's operations mm -hmm. completely. With respect to, and I believe you're, you're speaking, with respect to divestment, guns have just become risky, mm -hmm. right? The stock prices are volatile. Mm -hmm. What I've been doing since I've entered office, and reflected earlier this year in hiring a, chief, hiring a chief risk officer, is reducing the risk in our portfolio overall, mm -hmm. right? So I'm a numbers person, mm -hmm. and, and the numbers, and we've done the economic analysis, and we are not confident, in fact, we are very uncomfortable, that's why as a fiduciary I'm taking this step, mm -hmm to remove that risk from our portfolio and to replace that with securities that return, have the same return and overall reduce our portfolio risk. Mm -hmm. So they're not being punished. Mm -hmm. This is just the free marketplace at mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. We're saying we have a concern with your product, its profitability, and as an investor, I choose to put the state's money elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, with respect to the disclosure in doing business, we're not barring any firm from doing business with this office. What we are saying is that if you are a responsible actor and you're willing to step up and reduce the risk of your business and to do something that overwhelmingly most Americans support, that we will consider that a positive and do more business with you. Mm -hmm. And so others, they're not being barred or punished uh, we're just making good financial decisions that manage risk. Do you know what the dollar amount is of investments that the fund holds for any government um, manufacturer of firearms? Because you said civilian, so you're looking to divest the civilian. Is there, um, I mean, are you, are you, do the funds you, have, um, do we have yeah. interest in, are you, are you asking in the defense industry yes. generally? Yes, yeah. in the defense no, industry general. contractors. Yes, yeah. we do have interest in defense contractors. We will, you know, so long as the investments perform well, we will continue to hold that interest. We are focused on civilian firearm manufacturers. Is there okay. overlap though? There, I mean. in the, in the, there is overlap, not much in terms of our portfolio. Mm -hmm. Uh, there, 
yes, but there is there is some overlap. I believe in our portfolio, it's one company. Okay, and do you know what that one company is? Or that that one company is Northrop Grumman. Okay. Uh, they have a small part of their business uh, invested in this sector. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, been in touch with them. Mm -hmm. They intend to spin off that portion of their business uh, in 2020. Okay. Which specific stocks will you be divesting? The uh, Vista, uh, we can we can get you the list. Okay. The full Is that list. Yeah. yeah. How many companies total do you know? Uh, total, it's a total of five companies. Yeah. And for a total of $30 million? For a total of $30 million. Um, Treasurer Wooden, can you talk a little bit about your, it's your cousin, or your cousin's son who was yeah. killed. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? I imagine it might be hard to talk about, but. It was June 12, uh, 2000, 2012. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, uh, it was a very, very violent weekend mm -hmm. in the city of Hartford. And he was, he was the first of a very of several deaths that weekend, mm -hmm. unrelated, mm -hmm. um, in the north end of Hartford, mm -hmm. and yeah. Were you close to him? Was he around your age, or was he younger? Sure, he, was, he was. He was. He was twenty four. Okay. Um, you know, I'm I'm older, <laughs> but yes, we grew up together. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Any more you. questions? Did you consult with any other states in developing this initiative? The, uh, we consulted in terms of research, um, and I, you know, I talked to my colleagues across the country as, as well. M Ms. Rice, can you spell your first and last name for us? J-A-N-E-T-R-I-C-E. And you're from Hartford, you said, yes. right? Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.